Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Kapner Research Council webinar series. Today is our final webinar of the spring semester. And we have one of our new faculty, Dr. Stephanie Gates, as the speaker. Dr. Meng Shi Ling, chair of the Kapner Research Council, will make the formal introduction of our speaker. But before he does so, I would like to say a few words about the Kapner Research Council or CRC for short. We formalized CRC about four years ago as an advisory council that would provide advice to my office, that is the Kapner Office of Research. We do have faculty from every division represented on the council. We also have staff, graduate students, and postdocs representation. This webinar is an example of some of the activities of the council in addition to providing advice to me in my office. They also organize the annual Kapner Research Symposium, help make important decisions regarding several research related awards in Kapner and funding opportunities for my office like the Joy of Discovery Seed Grant Program. When they help make these decisions in the Office of Research, they are representing you, our faculty, staff, and students. In other words, CRC plays an important role in shared governance in our college. Before I hand over to Meng Shi, let me remind everyone that we will have a Q&A session in the end, but you need to post your questions in the Q&A box not in the chat room. And Dr. Lin will be moderating the Q&A session in the end. So without further ado, Meng Shi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Shibu. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Meng Shi Lin. I'm a professor in the food science program. I will be the moderator for today's webinar. I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Stephanie Gates. Dr. Gates is an assistant professor in biochemistry at Mizzou. Her main research interest is protein quality control and how chaperone proteins triage proteins for degradation by the major cellular protease. The 26S protozoan using techniques including cryo electron microscopy and the single molecule thread. Dr. Gates has received various honors, including a Howard Hughes Medical Institute postdoctoral fellow of the Damon uh, Luangyan Cancer Research Foundation, and awards from American Chemical Society, American Institute for Chemists, and the Society of Chemical Industries. Um, Without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Gates. It's all yours. All right, thank you for that great introduction. So I'll just go ahead and um, share my screen here. All right, so I'm, I'm really glad to be talking to you all today about the work that I am starting in my lab that um, just opened and also share a story from my postdoc to really illustrate how we can use cryo-electron um, microscopy to study protein quality control in diseases. So um, just a little background on who I am and, and where, you know, my scientific training. And so I started um, with my undergraduate training at Millican University, which is a small university in Decatur, Illinois, which is actually not too far from here. And um, that's where I really fell in love with research and biochemistry and got interested in going to graduate school. And then I um, moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan to get my graduate training at University of Michigan. And I worked for Daniel Southworth and he um, focused on protein quality control and chaperone proteins. And um, this is where I got my initial training in cryo-electromicroscopy. And there was a really fantastic environment to be learning cryo-EM at the time. Um, they were 
really, um, the university was really investing in cryo-EM and in the time that I was there, the technology and the microscopes that we had access to completely changed and we were, you know, keeping up with all the cutting edge um, technology. And so here's a, actually an image of me loading onto one of the, the newer microscopes and um, I got really incredible training there. And um, so then I decided to leverage that into a postdoc position that I then moved into um, UC Berkeley to work for Andy Martin to continue using cryo-EM, um, but then still focusing on protein quality control, but more from the ubiquitin proteasome side. So more of the degradation side of protein quality control. And so I continued doing structural biology, but also um, picked up another technique of single molecule fret while I was there and really um, putting together these two techniques and understanding uh, the dynamics of these different proteins. And so then, um, you know, I just started my lab in January, just opened up here at Mizzou. So here is my temporary lab space on the left and then um, my lab space that will be renovated on the right. And so, you know, I've been in this big transition and getting things set up right now and having a lot of fun with it and recruiting students and whatnot. And so um, I'm really excited to be here in the biochem department and um, getting this research program up and going. And so um, I wanted to first start off by introducing protein quality control and kind of what, what do I mean by that? And so, it, you know, in the cell, we have these proteins that are coming off of the ribosome in this unfolded or misfolded state, and they need to be able to get to their properly folded state or their native folded state. And um, also, if there is an issue with that, or they seem like they're too misfolded or aggregated, they can become ubiquitinated and sent to the 26S proteasome to be degraded. And this is the major protease of the cell. Um, on another side of kind of in protein quality control are these aggregates that can form. And so, of course, in the cell, things can happen. It forms aggregates, but hopefully, um, you know, these can be disaggregated or ubiquitinated and sent for degradation. They can also form higher order aggregates like amyloids, which we know are involved in neurodegenerative diseases. And so in disease, really, we're talking about an imbalance in protein quality control and kind of what changes happen there. So in cancer, it really exploits protein quality control because we have this increase and unfolded, misfolded proteins and aggregates, and we're, a lot of proteins are being sent then to the proteasome to be degraded. And so there's this reliance on the proteasome to evade apoptosis, to really um, be able to continue to replicate um, despite having all of this mismanaged proteins in the cell. And so a really effective technique to then um, to treat cancer would be to inhibit protein quality control or specifically to inhibit the proteasome. And there are inhibitors that are approved in the clinic for the proteasome like bortezomib, um, but they do have a lot of gain resistance and off tar target effects. And so really um, this kind of strategy is good, but it could be better if we could find better, um, better ways to be more targeted in our, um, in our inhibition of this. And then on the other side, we have neurodegeneration, where it's actually more of a failure of protein quality control, which we have more of these aggregates, more of these amyloid aggregates in diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multi-system proteinopathy. And it's really overwhelming the cells. And we need to be able to increase protein quality control to do a better job of clearing all of these aggregates. And so then um, the question becomes, how can we do that? How can we increase protein quality control? How can we actually allow for that um, disaggregation of these? And so um, chaperone proteins are these is a class of proteins that are important for all of these steps I've described in protein quality control. And they're really important for getting these proteins to their proper folded state. So here's an energy landscape here. Um, showing just the different kind of folded states that a protein might go through in its, in its lifetime. And so chaperones are good to get um, these proteins over these energy barriers and into their folded state or to inhibit them from actually getting into these aggregates as well as um, they can potentially also, they can disaggregate them and pull them out of these aggregate states. They also collaborate with these co-chaperones that could help them along through this folded pathway. And what's important is that they're these ATPases. They use, they go through an ATP hydrolysis cycle 
in which they undergo large conformational changes during substrate binding and release and um, in collaboration with these co-chaperones. And um, they are able to then, you know, fold and unfold and disassemble these different proteins. And they also act, you know, to protect from cellular stresses like heat shock, aggregation, aging, and disease. So what my lab is focusing on is what I've termed chaperone-mediated proteasomal degradation. So specific complexes of chaperones that will then directly shuttle proteins to the proteasome for degradation. So, you know, often we think of chaperones as really pro-folding, but this is really looking specifically at the pro-degradation pathway of chaperones. So we have these HSB70 chaperones in collaboration with these um, co-chaperones, the E3 ubiquitin ligases, which can append polyubiquitin chains. And then also these nucleotide exchange factors that also bind to HSB70 and those directly bind to the proteasome to hand off these substrates. So the, some of the key questions that I really want to address in my lab is, what is the mechanism of chaperone ubiquitination and substrate turnover? How do chaperones hand off substrates to the proteasome? Can we really look at this mechanism? And if we can really understand this, how can we then target the chaperone-mediated prote proteasomal degradation in disease and human health? And um, one of the key ways that I'm going to ask these questions is using cryo-electron microscopy. And so I first just wanted to kind of briefly describe cryo-EM and kind of the advantages of this technique and why it's so important to the kind of work that I do. And so the first step in a cryo-EM experiment is really getting your purified protein, protein complex, whatever it is you're looking at. And um, that can be a major bottleneck, but getting your protein purifi purified and in complex, and then you're gonna apply that to a cryo-EM grid, which is this holy carbon grid in which, um, and we will quickly snap freeze it, and which we call vitrification, so that we can get a thin layer of ice that we can image through. And so this is important because when we put it into the microscope, um, you know, we hit it with this electron beam and then we get these images that we call micrographs. Um, and so what you can see is your single particles here. And what we, what's happening is you have your protein, you know, tumbling around in solution in your buffer and then it's really quickly frozen. And so hopefully we have a nice distribution of, um, of angles and, and orientations of your particle in or your protein in solution so that we can then use these 2D particles, 2D images, and assign angles to them to then reconstruct into 3D space. And the major advantages of this um, kind of technique, especially for what I'm working with, is it's really suitable for um, these large protein complexes. So, you know, the proteasome is 2.5 megadaltons, and then you're adding on other proteins like these chaperone proteins. I mean, you can also look at uh, uh, membrane brown pro proteins. Um, you can capture multiple conformations in, in one data set. And this is really important for proteins that are really dynamic like the chaperone proteins I'm, I'm talking about, where they go through these large conformational changes. And so in one sample, there will be a lot of heterogeneity just from um, the movement of the protein, but we can actually use this technique to sort them out um, and then solve more than one structure. And then it's, it's in situ like um, technique. I, I mentioned it's kind of like in solution since we're, we're capturing these um, particles when they're in your buffer, just tumbling around. Hopefully they're in a pretty native state. And then um, we can now really achieve high resolution. And I want to describe to you how some of the advances that there have been in cryo-EM in the last decade that have really pushed the barrier and allowed us to achieve higher and higher resolution um, data. So this is what has been called the cryo-EM resolution revolution. And so here is a graph um, a bar graph just showing the increase in these high resolution structures um, solved by cryo-EM. And um, you see that with the, especially with the orange, which is in the like three to four angstrom range, really increasing um, starting in like 2012, 2012, when we had these huge breakthroughs in the technologies. And some, some of the major technological advances are you know, improvements of our microscopes and our cameras, as well as the computation. 
But as I mentioned in 2012, we had this huge breakthrough where there was now um, the commercially available direct electron detectors. And what's important about these is compared to previous detectors where they had an indirect detection with scintillation and whatnot, we started getting that information directly from the electrons um, going through your sample. And then also we're using dose fractionated movies in which we can lower the radiation damage that we get um, per frame and get a higher signal to noise by aligning all of, like a lot of frames in a longer exposure um, to really increase the signal to noise of our um, images, get rid of some of the thermal drift and some of the blurriness that we were having in images before. Um, and that really helped improve the resolution. Another thing that happened in 2012 is some of these software packages that were released, were released like RelyOn, um, really improved the ability of our 3D classification and 3D refinements that we can do and improve our ability to um, yeah, improve our resolution. And it also sped up because it made the computational demand a little bit less and a lot faster. And so these things together really kind of led the way for this re um, revolution in resolution. Um, and I just want to mention, you know, in 20, so in 2012, we had this, these changes. And then 2013, we had our first uh, really high resolution structure solved of an asymmetric um, structure by Cryo Yam out of UCSF at the Yifan Ching lab of this trip V1 ion channel, which was really exciting and really kind of set the stage for um, a lot more structures to be solved to this high resolution. Um, and so I mentioned all this, you know, and it's a really exciting time to be a new PI at Mizzou because we have access to these, this incredible technology. So we have the electron microscopy core here at the Next Gen Precision Health Building. And so here on the right is our Titan Creos, which is the, you know, most cutting edge and um, high resolution microscope you can have access to. We have a direct detector on it. Um, we have automatic data collection going. And so already we're having a lot of high resolution data collected on this microscope. And we're seeing um, really high resolution structures uh, being solved on this already. And so it's a really great place for me <laughs> to be and um, you know all the other new PIs that are in our department so that we can have um, access to this and get some really quality data. So, um, bringing this back to protein quality control, and I'm um, um, going to tell a story today um, that's from work in my postdoc that I want to focus on um, how a ubiquitinated substrate can be degraded by the 26S proteasome and using cryo-EM to better understand the mechanism of this substrate degradation and translocation. And so the proteasome, as I mentioned, is this 2.5 megadalton complex. It's a, it's a very large complex made of these um, smaller subcomplexes. So we have the 20S core peptidase, which is where the, um, the proteolytic cleavage sites are. And then it's capped on either end with the 19S regulatory particle, which can be um, further separated into subcomplexes. So we have the base which has this AAA ATPase motor and um, ubiquitin receptors, which are shown in orange. And those are important for engaging these ubiquitinated substrates. And then we have this, the lid complex, which is in yellow. It's got these scaffolding pro proteins, and then it has RPN11, which is the d ubiquitinase And that will remove um, ubiquitin chains during substrate processing. Um, so what I'm gonna focus on today is the AAA ATPase. So I wanted to um, kind of zoom in on this, show you where it is relative to everything. So it's in blue here, but um, we're gonna look at this. And so um, these AAA ATPases are hexameric complexes. So this is um, just a top-down view of that ATPase that was a part of that much larger complex. And um, AAA ATPases use ATP hydrolysis to power translocation of substrates through the central channel using these substrate gripping pore loops, which are aromatic uh, residues. But what's important about the proteasome is actually it's a heterohexamer. So most AAA ATPases are homohexameric. It's the same subunit six times. But um, this is an advantage of using the proteasome to kind of look at this translocation mechanism because they are heterohexameric and it's part of this much larger complex. So we can um, look at the individual subunits and how they move um, while they're processing substrate. 
Um, this is a really highly structurally conserved class of proteins with really diverse cellular functions. So proteolysis, uh, membrane trafficking, DNA replication, lots of things happening um, in the cell involve AAA ATPases. And they are really critical for protein quality control um, in these different kinds of classes I've already mentioned. So previous structures of the substrate bound proteasome showed this large conformational change. And so this work was actually also out of the uh, Martin lab at UC Berkeley. And this was done in 2013. So this was kind of before this huge revolution and re resolution for cryogam. But what we saw was um, in the substrate free com complex, we can see our you know, 20S core peptidase and our AAA motor. And we see that the RPN11 and the motor are you know, a little bit offset from the um, central channel of the core peptidase. But upon addition of substrate processing or um, substrate, we can have this substrate processing state, we see this large conformational change where it shifts and now the AAA motor is coaxially aligned with that core peptidase. So it can actually deliver it straight in. And then the RPN11 is now on top. Some of the things that were lacking in the structures, we couldn't see substrate. We didn't have a clear idea was what was happening with the register of the AAA motor. And these are all just resolution um, limitations. And so we wanted to come back at this, um, get a higher resolution structure and get more information about the substrate processing, especially in the AAA motor. And um, I also wanna mention, you know, the AAA field, as I said, is there are a lot of these AAA proteins and they really have this conserved mechanism and I worked on a different AAA motor in my PhD, which is shown here, HSP-104. So it's a homohexameric complex. And um, from our work on this, we were actually able to show this translocation mechanism based on how it was binding to substrate. And so um, I'm just gonna zoom in here into the central channel. And what we can see is these aromatic pore loops that I mentioned that will bind directly to that polypeptide substrate. And um, these are tyrosines in, in this protein here. And they uh, arrange into what we call a spiral staircase. And this is because they are binding to the substrate in like a stepping around that polypeptide, about two amino acids down um, on that polypeptide. And so what we think is that this translocation mechanism is what we call hand over hand, because we think that every individual subunit would occupy each of these positions in the spiral staircase as they would start at the top and then they would pull it down, they would release, and then they would become the next one on top. So hand over hand as they continue to hydrolyze ATP, move downward, pull downward, and then resume that position at the top. And so then questions going forward with our study on the proteasome, which is this heterohexameric complex, is can we get more information about how these motors unfold substrate and how specifically does ATP hydrolysis drive this translocation mechanism? And so to do this, we wanted to look at a ubiquitous substrate while it's being actively degraded by the 26S proteasome. And so to do this, um, our experimental setup is we purified proteasomes out of yeast, and then we inhibited RPN11, which is this deubiquitinase. And so this is really effective in, in getting that substrate stuck in this channel here because it won't remove the polyubiquitin and it will just get, it'll just stay there, but it'll continue to hydrolyze ATP, keep pulling on it, the motor will keep moving, but then we'll have it in this kind of fixed register where it's not gonna go beyond that ubiquitin, it will stay substrate bound. So then we um, you know, performed cryo-YAM and then did some conformational sorting with this focus on the AAA motor and what it's doing. Because based on the previous study, we do know that the rest of the proteasome really isn't moving so mu as much in this. The core isn't gonna move, the lid, it's all gonna stay really static. And that movement is gonna be in the AAA motor. And so um, we did this large data collection um, using image shift. So it, we were able to take 10 images per hole, which is a lot. And then on the right here, I have like a single image or micrograph where you can see single particles over here on, on the right. 
And, um, you know, at the time, this seemed like a huge feat. We were getting a, like 11,000, 12,000 micrographs, and it took like, a week to collect this data. But I will give a shout out to our core, you know, with the advances in, in data collection and everything, you can get 11,000 micrographs in like a day or two now. So things just keep getting faster and faster. So we were able to get a nice and large data set, which was really important to do all this confirmational sorting. And then we were able to sort in 3D, get rid of anything that was super low resolution. And then um, we were able to use symmetry expansion to double the amount of particles we have. So the only information we really want to focus on is in this AAA motor. So what we want is since we have two regulatory particles per um, per particle, per full particle, we can use the pseudosymmetry of the proteasome, which has this C2 symmetry axis that you can apply just down the middle of the core peptidase. And then when you symmetry expand it, what you're effectively doing is flipping these particles along that axis and then in the applying a mask so you only see that one half. And now you have effectively doubled your particles. You can get rid of any that don't have any um, of the regulatory particle and then um, apply a mask specifically around that AAA motor. So that's all we're focusing on. So we're no longer trying to understand what's happening with the rest of the, the structure, but only on the movements that are occurring there and um, really do sorting. So from this, we were able to get these um, multiple AAA motor states that were revealed from this at pretty moderate resolution. It wasn't super high, but it was enough for us to answer the questions that we had and learn a lot about this translocation mechanism. So here's kind of the first view of our proteasome structure. Um, and so we have our core peptidase in, in gray here. And on top, we have that AAA mortar in blue. We have the um, lid and these shades of yellow. We have um, ubiquitin here in orange. So we have our ubiquitin, or just we can see a single ubiquitin bound to our substrate, which is in pink. And we can see that going all the way through the, um, the base and then into the top of the core particle. We also can see RPN11 here. And so we can see that ubiquitin bound in that active site, ready to be cleaved if it you know, weren't inhibited the way that we did. And so here I'm actually going to show just kind of a zoom in on that. And so here's that active site where we have this isopeptide bond between the glycine of ubiquitin and um, the lysine of our substrate. We have this insert one hairpin, which is the active state of our PN11. When we look at it top down, we can see that active site is aligned with the channel, which is what we would expect based on the previous structure where it all shifts over. And now we can see directly down into the core. And then here I have the, um, the six RPTs or the different subunits of the AAA motor highlighted in different colors. And then when we zoom into that central channel, we see this spiral staircase of pore one loops that interact with the substrate. So this is similar to the other structure I showed you of HSP-104. Um, and what we would expect, expect is these aromatics, um, our tyrosines are interacting with our polypeptide in this stepping of about two amino acids around that polypeptide. And so I want to highlight here really these distinct states that we saw in translocation. They've got one to two um, subunits that are disengaged. And so this is what's kind of important about the spiral staircase that we've seen previously is there's um, always at least one subunit that's disengaged. And then we have the rest of them in this spiral staircase. And so this is just a top-down view of the CrowEM maps to kind of demonstrate that. But then here is what our models look like. And so we found three unique staircases. So these two are the same here, where they have in green, RPT1 is at the top. We have RPT5 in light blue is off. And then we have, so we have the spiral all the way down to RPT4 in, in um, red. That's, that's the bottom. And that's what you see here. And then we have this one that has two off subunits with RPT2 at the top. And then we have this other staircase where it's actually RPT5, which was the off subunit in this state, is now at the top and RPT4 is off. So we have what we think are actually sequential states. And so I'm going to show you what I mean um, in, this, in this movie here. And so we can do a morph map between these two states in what we think is a translocation step. 
And what was really was really helpful about being in the proteasome is we can just align our models based on the core peptidase and then observe the movement of our subunits relative to the core peptidase. And so that's what we're doing here. So we have in the one state, we have RPT1 in green at the top of our spiral staircase. RPT4 in red is at the bottom. And then we have RPT5 in the off. And so in this movie, I want you to watch the movements specifically of RPT5 and 4. We are gonna see RPT5 now move in to be at the top is RPT4 is retracting to be off of the bottom. So now we have this rearrangement where we have a new spiral staircase. RPT5 is now at the top. And RPT4 went from the bottom to off. Now I'm going to actually turn it to show you what the other subunits were doing while those were rearranging. So we're just going to turn it. And these are all the stably bound ones are just going to move downwards. So we are actually seeing that translocation, that pulling downwards of these uh, of that polypeptide with these other subunits that are stably bound and um, kind of as like a rigid body just pulling down. And so this was really exciting because for the first time we can actually see this translocation movement that we've been, you know, hypothesizing from, um, you know, other structures, but we can actually see that movement between these states. So the question is, what changes in the AT hydrolysis cycle occur between these consecutive states? What, what was it that caused this large conformational change and this huge rearrangement of our AAA motor? And the answer is both a nucleotide exchange and an ATP hydrolysis event happen between these two spiral staircases that I mentioned before that have the same spiral staircase but we identified them as different um, motor states because they of their hydrolysis states. And so we think these are prerequisite for that translocation step I just showed. So that's between these two states. So we were able to identify the nucleotide state of each of the pockets. So in um, the ones that say T, that's ATP, and the ones that say D are ADP. What we saw is that the stably bound subunits, which are the ones that I showed that just went down like this, are stay in an ATP state. And the off um, and preceding subunits are in this ADP state. But we see that a nucleotide exchange occurs in RPT5 as a prerequisite for substrate binding. So we see this ADP being exchanged for ATP before it then becomes the new top subunit in this other translocation state. And then on the other side, we see RPT3 um, three, which is in orange, hydrolyze ATP, which we think destabilizes this pocket between RPT3 and 4 in red to then kick off RPT4 to now be the off subunit. So this hydrolysis event is really pushing off the other subunit while the other one is binding ATP and coming in at the top. And so from all of this, we were excited to really learn how um, ATP hydrolysis drives that translocation, drives those large conformational changes um, in the sub in the AAA motor, and we were able to use cryonics to really like see physically see that movement. So we were able to solve four substrate engaged motor states um, and, and see this incredible movement and how it's associated with ATP hydrolysis. Uh, we visualized the ubiquitin isopeptide bond in this RPN11 active site which is what we would expect, but it was really nice to actually see this and see that substrate all the way through to the core. And these consecutive translocation states really show how ATP hydrolysis can drive motor function. And so what I want to drive home about this was, um, you know, we really exploited the incredible um, power of cryo-EM to see how this protein, this, this large protein, the proteasome can move and have these dynamic movements and really work on a substrate. And this is exactly what I want to do in my own group, but with other proteins. And so coming back to protein quality control and, you know, really how do these pathways intersect? Um, how can we now look at how chaperones are involved in protein quality control? So we've got the HSB 70 and 90s and these co-chaperones that I mentioned before, and how can they triage proteins between folding and degradation? And can we look at these conformational changes that these chaperones also go through um, and understand their dynamics and how that affects 
um, downstream degradation. So once again, here's kind of that, um, that graphic I have just showing this chaperone mediated proteasomal degradation. And the questions we want to ask about this triaging of substrates, how do chaperones affect substrate degradation? And how do the conformational dynamics of chaperones affect substrate handoff to the proteasome? And so the approach I'll use is in vitro biochemistry, cryo-EM, of course, as I've mentioned, and then um, also include single molecule FRET to look at the um, dynamics in real time and seeing how that can really affect substrate degradation downstream of these conformational changes. And so with that, I would just like to um, thank some people, you know, of course, my previous lab, um, Andy Martin, and um, the members that worked on this project with me. So Ellen Goodall, um, Gabe Lander, and Andres de la Pena at the um, Scripps Research Institute. And then, you know, the, now I have some students in my lab, um, as well as just my current and previous funding. And so with that, I will take any questions. Okay, very good. Thank you, Stephanie. Next uh, will be the Q&A session. Um, for the audience, you can post your question using the Zoom Q&A feature. Uh, here's the, uh, I see the question one. What is the steel geometry of ADP? HYD residue translocated. Uh, can you repeat that or maybe I can look at it? What oh, is the, I don't know how to pronounce, what is the steel chemistry? I think it's typo something. Stoichiometry of ATP hydrolysis. Of ATP, ADP HYD uh, residue translocated. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So um, we kind of think of it like per ATP hydrolysis event, we get one translocation event. So the hydrolysis in the one subunit then causes that movement down of about two amino acids and the rearrangement where one will come off and then become um, the new top, and the other one will come become the new top one. So about one ATP for the two amino acids translocation step. Okay, hey, very good. Um, second question is, uh, can you elaborate more on how the protein quality control research can help disease prevention and solve health problems? Yeah, so um, the kinds of things that I think, you know, the research that I do would help with is if we can understand how chaperones are, you know, triaging proteins um, for degradation or pro, um, for profolding, if we can really fix the balance in these different diseases. So in there, like I mentioned, they're kind of the opposite for cancer and neurodegeneration, where in cancer, you really want to inhibit protein quality control. So finding ways to do that. Um, and so I would think a more effective technique would be actually inhibiting these events um, about you know previous um, before the proteasome to get maybe a more specific um, effect, and then um, for protein quality control in neurodegeneration, it's trying to find ways to improve the um, disaggregation ability of the chaperones or um, yeah to increase protein quality control, and so that's why I think the understanding the conformational dynamics of um, these chaperones. You know, we if we can tilt the balances of like how quickly they're moving or how quickly they're um, being able to help refold and unfold, then we might be able to tip the balances of protein quality control in neurodegeneration. So those are kind of the two ways I would I would go at it. Okay, very good. Um, any more questions from the audience? I have one more question. Now. Uh, in recent years. Artificial intelligence tools uh, have been used more and more in many different areas, such as Alpha Fold 2. Mm -hmm. So, what do you think? Uh, what's your opinion on this kind of AI tools? Are they going to facilitate the research in protein quality control, or are they going to challenge uh, the research in this area? Um, yeah, I think Alpha Fold is an incredible 
uh, technology that has really advanced the field of structural biology. And it's a really good tool to use in, um, in collaboration with techniques like, like Crow-EM. Um, I think it will definitely advance the field in lots of ways. And the kinds of complexes I'm looking at are really large. And because of their um, dynamics, they're, they're a little bit more challenging for AI to to solve and you know of course I have looked at <laughs> some of my own things using alpha fold and you know it struggles with that so um it's really great to have these kinds of um techniques to really push the field forward it helps us solve our structures too if we have some sort of model to start with and then um but you know there's still room for then the, the experimental um setup of like cryo EM to you know, they complement each other in a lot of ways. Okay, uh, next question is, is translocation of the substrate bi-directional or one way? Yeah, that, that's a good question, um, especially because in the AAA field, um, you know, a lot of different AAAs, especially the homohexameric ones, can be, um, you know, um, bi-directional, you know, can pull from either side. Um, the proteasome generally pulls from the C-terminus, like an unstructured tail of the C-terminus of the protein. And then, um, so it is really one directional and in, 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 into the core. There's also the two, um, since there's the two caps, the two regulatory particles, both sides can pull uh, substrates into it. Um, you know, there's some amount of, you know, there seems to be some communication between the two sides, but they can also just be doing completely different things. So um, in a way it's bi-directional that way, but um, it's generally just the one way through the AAA. Okay, very good. Um, any more questions from the audience? Uh, next question is uh, not my area, but I think misfolded glycoproteins can get exported from the ER and degraded by 26S. Do the glycans necessarily get removed before they go through 26S? What happens to translocation? if it hits a right hand? Uh, that's a really interesting question. I don't ac actually know the answer, although I would um, guess that something like P97 or other um, factors that would interact with it before it um, interacted with the 26S might um, do something about removing the glycan. So I'm not officially sure about that that's a good question okay thank you um any more questions from the audience well um if no more questions shibu do you want to say a few words okay um well Thank you, Meng Shi, for uh, moderating the Q&A session. Um, so Stephanie, thank you very much for an informative talk and, and leading the lively discussion or Q&A session. And thanks to all of you for attending today's webinar. As I said in the beginning, this was the, the final uh, webinar for our uh, spring semester. So I will see you next time, which will be most likely in the fall. I don't think we will have a webinar series in the summer. So we will uh, see you again at the next webinar in the fall semester. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.